Ontology, the way station of red pill sanity. Written by William Leo. Translated by Deep L and a human. Read for you by Eric, Jenny, Mia, and many other bots. Previously in the Ontology podcast series. The Taliban's organization is far from reaching the level of cohesiveness of the Islamic State who has built its own system and provides for all its soldiers and political cadres. The Islamic State appears to occupy no territory on the surface of the earth, while the Taliban still possesses at least a few provinces. Even after losing territorial control, the Islamic State with tens of thousands of permanent troops is still much more powerful than the Taliban. The Taliban welcomed the Islamic State, coming with money and weapons. But there is no free lunch. Season 4. The Islamic World and the Inner Asian Order. Episode 3. The Islamic State is more like the Communist International. The Islamic State is a much sophisticatedly organized group. It is an international organization. You can tell that from that fact that many of the fighters of the Islamic State are Caucasian Europeans and Americans, just like many of the fighters of the Communist International were Dutch, British, and Germans. The British, the Dutch, and the Germans came to the East and found themselves worshipped as lords. They were by no means local rustic warlords. It is common for Europeans and Americans to join the Islamic State, just as it was common for them to join the Communist International back then, and bring in big bucks. The Taliban is somewhere between the Islamic State and the warlords. After the Islamic State entered Nangarhar, the local Taliban cried, if this goes on, the Taliban will all become the Islamic State. Finally, the two sides turned on each other. The Taliban fought the Islamic State on one side and the government forces on the other, and sometimes cooperated with the Afghan government forces and the Americans to fight the Islamic State. Both the Americans and the Taliban consider the Islamic State their most deadly nemesis. After capturing tens of thousands of Taliban in Kunduz and Kandahar, the Americans would often simply hand out discharge fees and disband them on the spot, when it comes to the Islamic State, on the other hand, all must be shot on sight. And, of course, that distinction is correct. From the perspective of intelligence agencies, the Islamic State is simply a contemporary version of the Communist International. Numerous Americans have become members of the Islamic State themselves. The Taliban can't recruit any other than Pakistanis and Afghans. The Islamic State is a world revolutionary organization with the ultimate goal to Islamize America itself. The Taliban's interest is confined to Afghanistan and they fight only against the local warlords. The Taliban can be converted, integrated, and disbanded while the Islamic State is a lifelong vowed professional revolutionary organization that cannot be disbanded but only annihilated. However, the Islamic State has the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan as its white glove in the north and the Uyghur Islamic Movement, IMU, as its white glove. In the south, it has the Taliban as its white glove. This is the current status of the Taliban. As an organization, its cohesion is only slightly stronger than the traditional warlords, but not much, and certainly can't compete with the Islamic State. This has a lot to do with its financial incapacity as a loose coalition of emerging warlords or semi-warlords. The Islamic State has been lurking in the Taliban ranks for a long time, waiting for the time to ripe in order to push aside the Taliban forces and openly establish the Islamic State Liberation Zone. Why doesn't it do that now, instead of operating in the name of the Taliban? The answer is that the American planes are still there and it is not wise to make unnecessary sacrifices. Meanwhile, the Uzbek-Tajik border, where the northern warlords rule, the areas bordering UIM and the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan, and the areas bordering Pakistan's tribal areas along Nangarhar and Logar in the southeast are the hardest hit by Islamic State infiltration. These places are nominally under the control of the Taliban, most of whom are IS covert operatives. The real Taliban cannot do anything about the well-armed Islamic State. Let's bear in mind that the Islamic State has 60,000 professional fighters more than the Afghan government and the Taliban combined. The Afghan government claims to have 300,000 troops, most of whom are warlords. The Taliban claim to have 80,000 men, most of whom are also warlords. Warlords don't count. One of the characteristics of warlords is that they preserve their strength and refuse to fight brutal battles. No one would subject his soldiers to great losses. 
Deadly is reserved for the Afghan security forces, the Taliban's Red Unit, and the Islamic State's forces. A major divorce of appearance and substance thus happened. It appears to be that the Afghan government occupies two-thirds of Afghanistan, the Taliban occupies a quarter of the land, and the Islamic State occupies only bits and pieces. But in reality, both the Taliban and the Afghan government have only a few thousand full-time loyal soldiers, with only a billion dollars or so in revenue each, whereas the Islamic State has 50,000 to 60,000 elite troops, whose revenue from Europe and the Levant is ten times more than the Taliban and the Afghan government combined. Of course, the warlords are necessarily opportunistic. When the Afghan government is backed by the Americans, they are willing to follow the Afghan government, once the Americans leave, they are easily won over by the other side. In 2020, just as the Afghan peace process is about to reach an agreement in Doha, the Afghan government could not get any loans anymore. Everyone knew that once the Americans left, the Afghan government was nothing. By now, the Afghan government forces have been in arrears for 10 months. Most of the Afghan government forces are warlord forces. How can warlords fight if they are not paid? They would just wait for others to bring the money and pay them to fight. If the Taliban or the Islamic State brings the money, first of all, please pay us back the past 10 months salary, and second, pay us another 3 months salary in advance. Then, we will follow you. That's a lot of money, to put it mildly. It would be several billion dollars, at least 3 billion dollars. That is an estimate for buying off the warlords of the Afghan provinces, which are the vast majority of the generals of the Afghan government forces. The Taliban can't afford it. There are two groups that have this much money. The first is the Islamic State and the second is China. So the Taliban must have gotten their money from either or both. Judging from IS documents seized by the US, the Islamic State exhibits, contrary to prevailing impressions, striking similarities to the Communist International and the Soviet Union. That is, the largest sector of the Islamic State is not the military which you would have imagined to be the largest branch of a proto-state established by military offensives. The security forces and religious supervisors, which are the Soviet equivalent of the KGB and Chaika, have the largest number of people and take the first place. In the second place is the military. Across the Islamic State system, all Islamic State fighters, religious supervisors, and security force soldiers are Islamic State members, just as the KGB were necessarily Communist Party members. But in the other sectors, the education sector, the finance sector, the agriculture sector, only the officials are members of the Islamic State. The common people are the ruled class. They are not part of the top-down structure of the Islamic State. The agriculture department is only responsible for profiting from agriculture, and the education department is for ensuring schools conformity to the Islamic Sharia. Only the officials are members of the Islamic State, those under them are not. When the Islamic State loses land and people, it is not losing its life and blood. Only the army, the security forces, and the religious ombudsman are its backbones. And, to put it in Soviet terms, the KGB outnumbered the Soviet Red Army. This feature is both an incentive and a deterrent for the soldiers. Lifelong provisions are the incentive, and a security force with the internal monitoring and purification personnel outnumbering the army personnel is the deterrent. If you offend the Taliban, it will send assassins after you, but you will not necessarily die. If you run afoul of the Islamic State, it will mobilize the entire secret service apparatus to go after you, and you will have no chance of survival. History shows the Taliban is likely to be a transitory phenomenon that shall gradually be swallowed up by the Islamic State. Thank you for listening. This is a podcast series produced by Luminous Society. Luminous Society provides you with an alternative historical narrative. 